Good afternoon and welcome to the Medical Center Hour, the University of Virginia's weekly public forum on medicine, healthcare, and society. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics in the School of Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today. Indeed, you might make a lunch date with us every Wednesday. The slides at the start and the end of this program provide resources, information about continuing education credit for healthcare professionals. They also provide a link to our center's website for information about today's presenters and links about the new book we're featuring and a link to Medical Center Hour's YouTube channel with where our program recordings appear. This program's closed caption recording will be posted to YouTube. On Zoom, we handle our audience's questions using the Q&A function. Write your questions and comments there. We'll monitor them as they're submitted and we'll make them the stuff of my conversation with our presenters in the closing minutes of the hour. Our program today, one of our history of the health sciences lectures at Medical Center Hour, charts the topography of wellness, how health and disease shape the American landscape, in a fascinating book bearing the same name and being published this July by UVA Press, architect Sarah Jensen Carr has investigated how significant shifts in the American urban landscape over the last 150 years often originated in health concerns around epidemic or pandemic disease. Now a full year into COVID, we join Professor Carr at the intersection of public health and urban and environmental history. And we find ourselves at an inflection point between living in this, our pandemic, and moving into a post-pandemic future. Sarah Jensen Carr is an assistant professor in Northeastern University School of Architecture. She'll be joined in this hour by UVA urban and environmental planner, Tim Beatley, the Teresa Heinz Professor of Sustainable Communities in our School of Architecture. Together with them, we will map the topography of wellness in our urban public spaces, even as we anticipate COVID-driven COVID design changes, even a new ecology of health. This Medical Center Hour is co-presented with UVA Press, which is publishing Sarah's book, the UVA School of Architecture Center for Design and Health, and historical collections in the Claude Moore Health Sciences Library. Thank you all. In the best tradition of our History of the Health Sciences lectures, this Medical Center Hour looks back in order to take us forward. And now we welcome Sarah Jensen Carr. Thank you, Marsha, and thank you everybody uh, for joining me today. It's my, um, it's my extreme pleasure to present at UVA. Um, like uh, many of you, I just wish I was there in person, but I, I thank you for this kind invitation, Marsha, and I thank you, Tim, for taking time out of your busy schedule as well to uh, respond. So as Marsha mentioned, uh, I am actually a, an architect. And the question that has formed the basis of my research is how does the design of buildings, landscapes and the public realm heal or harm us? This question was really formed early in my career uh, as I worked as a healthcare architect. And so I was working on hospitals, I was working on uh, maternity wards, inpatient psychiatric units, um, and rehabilitation gardens, which struck uh, my interest immediately. Uh, and I was thinking about the relationship between evidence-based design and these healthcare spaces that we were doing and what the outcomes were on, on healing in a very acute way. But the other part of this story is that at this time, I was working in New Orleans and the Gulf South, and I was living there that when Hurricane Katrina hit. So like most, I had the privilege to evacuate. Like much fewer, I had the privilege to come back when many of them didn't. And the time after I came back was really consumed with the recovery for some time. I was doing FEMA surveys, rehabilitating client buildings, and going to community planning meetings. And I started to think about that in the absence of hospitals, which there were no hospitals online for quite some time after the hurricane, what are the effects of our landscape as well? And how does the urban landscape work as a healthcare infrastructure? Um, that is what led me to a shift in my career to actually get my, my master's in landscape architecture and then a PhD in environmental planning uh, to explore this topic very specifically. 
And I definitely thought uh, naively at the time that I would come up with some sort of landscape guidelines for health, maybe similar to how you would read the AIA and AAH guidelines when designing um, a hospital. So even though that was my initial goal, um, I had already seen how landscape could also be wielded to displace people in the name of well-being and safety, in particular the type of unspecified top-down green space that we often see in vision plans. For those that are not familiar, this is the infamous green dot map released by the Bring New Orleans Back Commission after Hurricane Katrina, which just widely deemed low-lying areas to be raised for parks or for, for flood parks, which is a terminology that we use today as we think about coastal resilience also. But this was very discomforting for anybody that lived there, obviously. And to be in New Orleans during the recovery and hear the constant conversation about rebuilding quote unquote healthier communities and what was implied in that drove me to look for more specific answers about what the topography of wellness meant. And so while I did, and I still strongly believe in the power of urban landscapes, and I hope that comes through today um, in their role in addressing health, I did come in somewhat skeptical about how these conversations about health were framed. And so while I'm not a historian, again, uh, I am a designer that wanted to better understand how our present day landscape came to be, how it was built, how it responded to past health crises, um, and to understand the shifting ideas about public health. Uh, and so, you know, this is really sort of a, a chapter long detour in my dissertation, but finally it's become a book. I'm very grateful and extremely grateful to UVA Press who is publishing it um, this summer. Um, this is what it's become, and uh, I will say as someone who's been looking at, at health and diseases, uh, health, diseases, and landscapes for about a decade now, um, I'm, I'm still honestly trying to wrap my head around what the COVID-19 pandemic means, and so I have some nascent thoughts at the end of the talk today. Um, what, while I don't have any predictions about its future, what I do want to talk about today is how the history of American epidemics got us to the landscape we currently inhabit and what we must keep in point at this mo or keep in mind at this point in time. So first, I think most of us on this call know that the places we live are inextricably tied to our health. Modern day diseases are often a complicated knot of genetic lifestyle and environmental factors. In 2016, Karen DeSalvo, who was the interim secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services at the time, noted that public health had entered a new era where one's zip code is a better indicator of health than your genetic code. What I was interested in as a planner and as a designer though, is what is the image of a healthy or unhealthy neighborhood? And how did we get to the image on the left, um, which is a densely populated urban center uh, being an unhealthy environment to the image on the right where now we think of as a car centric uh, suburban or exurban um, environment that's been decried by uh, many public health researchers again. And of course, uh, this is when I wrote the book, maybe we're on the verge of that turning over again and, and the suburbs being a place of health, but perhaps we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but prior to this current pandemic, I think we saw a real shift over the past 150 years in what is considered a healthy and unhealthy environment. And you can just look at some of the literature that came around in the 1970s and 1980s. So we have six cities, um, the, the diagnosis of our urban crisis and finally uh, culminating in Mike Davis's dead cities. However, when I was starting the program, this was more of the literature that I was looking at. So it's happy city, uh, milking healthy places toward the healthy uh, cities and building healthy places. Um, and this was starting to forefront, you know, dense-ish walkable areas um, and, and the cities as greener places, more walkable places. And so that's, that's the shift I was interested in. What I think we can, uh, you know, sort of broadly generalize this shift as is first of all, looking at what we are responding to when we design our environments. And I would say in response to these epidemics, we have control, we have designed our environments to control in this order, miasma, germs, and behavior. So first thinking about miasma or the fear of disease in air, this has been uh, a, a foundational theory since Hippocrates on airs, waters, and places, which connected the health of the environment to the health of, health of those that inhabit it. His writings describe the difference between wholesome and unwholesome waters, the latter being marshy and stagnant, talking about those that drank from them as being in possession of large and obstructed spleens, their bellies hard, emaciated and hot, and their shoulders, collarbones, and faces emaciated. 
these theories had wide acceptance well into the 20th century, most notably in the form of this miasma theory, which associated the tangibly foul air and water in cities at the time to airborne disease. And so the first movement connecting the built environment to population health correlates with the beginnings of American urban history during the Industrial Revolution. As factories and workforce populations grew in city centers, so did the amount of waste and sewage dumped in the streets. Slaughterhouses were often still inside city limits. There was no municipal sanitation and air pollution was rampant. rampant. Many housing units lacked indoor plumbing or sufficient light and fresh air and massive outbreaks of cholera, typhoid and yellow fever required coordinated action between planners, engineers, public health officials and doctors in these fields. Of particular concern were these crowded tenements and this cartoon featured in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper in 1865 was entitled The Tenement Houses of New York, How the Poor Live in Crowded Cities, How Pestilence is Generated, How Parents are Demoralized and Their Children Depraved, the Great Source of Destitution and Crime. Social scientists who were just beginning to explore the connections between environment and behavior pointed to physical density as a risk factor for moral contagion as well as disease spread. And cholera specifically became ever more correlated with the generalized urban condition, especially regarding dense housing. And so here we see cholera as a skeleton telling the landlord of a tenement that he is about to occupy the premises. Tenements were routinely described as perpetual fever nests by New York sanitary inspectors in their citywide surveys. And so we see the biggest changes coming from this massive sanitary infrastructure that was built in response to the rampant disease that was in cities at the time. It was during this time that many combined sewage, wastewater, and street runoff systems were installed in cities that, uh, that are still uh, utilized today. Naturally open waterways uh, were contained in underground culverts and paved over. Marshlands were filled in, not only to get rid of the miasmic gases, but to accommodate industrial expansion and move them away from residential areas as well. The outfall of these waste systems was often still in an open water body though, uh, but at least it was moved out of the center of the city. And many subscribe to the uh, idea that the solution to pollution is dilution. Um, and although a significant body of scientists and doctors actually did not believe that disease was spread through the air, a multi-pronged strategy of personal municipal sanitation, alleviating density, remaking or removing industry and worker housing, um, radically remade the haphazard landscape of American cities at the time. So here you can see a uh, edition of Harper's Weekly from 1895, which is comparing photos of the same street corners two years earlier to show the success of the sanitation movement. Um, waste infrastructure really configured, reconfigured the streets of our cities. They became longer, straighter, wider. Uh, even cobblestones were, were thought to hold miasmic filth between them sometimes and were switched out for smooth pavement that could be washed down at the end of the day. Many planners were also looking to Europe to see how they had controlled their own cholera and yellow fever epidemics. Um, and while looking at specifically the, the massive waste infrastructure that they had installed, there was a theoretical basis to it as well. Richard Sennett in the book Flesh and Stone discusses how many 18th and 19th century European cities prioritized circulation and movement via their street networks in the wake of physician William Harvey's discoveries about how the heart powered blood circulation. Dirt and grime were thought to clog healthy airs throughout the city. Palaces and places of commerce acted as hearts that would power movement. And one-way streets were often employed to maintain fast movement and mimic the one-way directionality of veins and arteries in the bodies. And again, we can see some of those translations to American urban landscapes, perhaps most clear in Daniel Burnham's plan of Chicago. But the idea of green spaces, of breathing spaces, of places where dirty air could dissipate uh, is also seen in a lot of the large parks that were built around the same period of the time. After streets and, and immediate sanitary um, infrastructure transformed American cities, many started to look at parks as a way to literally breathe fresh air into the streets. Frederick Law Olmsted, who was the designer of Central Park, was actually also the executive secretary of the US Sanitary Commission for some time. And his time working in public health convinced him that density and slum conditions were the root causes of disease and that disease was carried through water and atmosphere as well. Central Park and many other of his parks leveraged fear about the detrimental health effects of diseases to advocate for the health benefits of green space from providing a mental health respite from the business of the city to the supposed filtering effects of trees on bad airs. 
Um, uh, Olmsted wrote anecdotally uh, about what we might call ecosystem services today in the present day city. Um, in his book on public parks and the enlargement of towns, he wrote, air is disinfected by sunlight and foliage. Foliage also acts mechanically to purify the air by screening it. Opportunity and inducement to escape at frequent intervals from the confined and vitiated air of the commercial quarter and to supply the lungs with air screened and purified by trees and recently acted upon by sunlight together with opportunity and inducement to escape from conditions requiring vigilance, wariness, and activity toward other men. So there were two things here that Olmsted was talking about, despite the direct cleaning properties of the trees. One about the mental health benefits of, of parks, um, which has again been proven through empirical research today, much of the great research done at the UVA uh, Center for Design and, and Health, which is hosting us today. Um, but also the importance of bringing nature into the city. And he saw a pattern of the elite uh, leaving dense urban areas for country homes, a pattern which might sound familiar with the COVID-19 pandemic. And Olmsted was dedicated to bringing nature to people that had to stay in the city as well. Health and specifically the search for fresh air was also a large driver of the move to Western cities like Phoenix and Denver, which grew significantly by specifically recruiting asthmatics. Dr. Charles Dennison's Rocky Mountain Health Resorts written in 1880 advertised Colorado as the Switzerland of the Americas, evoking images of clean mountain air, uh, but also the generally accepted superior moral values of Europeans. And this map by Denison attempts to show the climatic patterns of Colorado, specifically its dry, cool air. Again, invoking um, this uh, social and moral sophistication, Denison wrote about Colorado Springs that it is the home also of a cultivated class of people who have been attracted to the state by health conditions. It's in fact estimated that up to a quarter of people who settled in Colorado, Arizona, and California in the late 1800s and very early 1900s did so for their health or a family member's health. Um, by 1890, Denver had grown by almost a third uh, with almost 30,000 people moving there to treat consumption. And this rate of growth would persist for the next three decades. However, these commonly accepted ideas of how environment affected health were really upended with the development of vaccines. While the immediacy of infectious disease abated somewhat, it still did not stop architects and planners from exploring um, these ideas about a medical architecture, but transferred to ways of living. Knowing that the pandemics of the early 1900s, namely the flu um, and tuberculosis could be addressed by medicine, density was no longer an immediate concern, but thinking about how architecture could optimize bodies and health on an individual level was. And although concepts of health and built environment were still mostly theoretical at this point, um, and uh, earlier ideas about miasma combined with developing building technology and fears of the danger of the street increasingly congested by cars influenced much of the large modern plans of the time. This is Le Corbusier's Radiant City, which was conceived as a vertical garden city, which was another health prototype that was based on health. Um, however, Corbusier used the sanitary uh, infrastructure, centralized it, and started to build buildings upwards. Corbusier envisioned all interactions as internal to the building itself. And so the idea of street as a public realm or a place of communing was eliminated for the resident's safety. Corbusier also thought he was liberating his building's residents from this filth or grime. His machines for living are intensely focused on what the right measurements were for an individual. And a community was made simply by reproducing those units over and over again. In his writings for the hypothetical Radiant City, Corbusier would talk about vaccination-like uh, distributions of sun um, and air. He said that there would be, that in, a, in an ideal living unit, there would be 14 square meters per occupant in an apartment. 12 meters of plate glass window to let in the exact amount of healthful light. The air would always be at 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Eight liters were to go through the room every minute for what he called exact respiration. That the residents would walk no more than 100 meters to transport. And that could be an elevator or a taxi that would be on the bottom floor to take them away from the street. Um, and also he wrote that 50 meters above ground level is only where the pure air was accessed, which leaves a question of who had to live below the 50 meter mark. 
And while Corbusier has only one built work in the United States, uh, the Carpenter Center at Harvard University, I think we can still see the influence of his writing and especially his work with the European Consortium Siam in many public housing units that were built in the mid century. However, built without the context of the European social safety net, many of the ideas that they were pushed, uh, extreme density to keep green space around buildings, reimagining the corridor as a place of social interaction, and perhaps most of all, the aesthetic disruption and separation from existing contexts ended up being detrimental to resident health instead. And these mixed metaphors of bodies and cities were also wielded to ruinous ends in the mid-century through the form of urban renewal. Cancer at the time was an epidemic that researchers soon realized could not be conquered by vaccines. In fact, a federally funded early 1960s study attempted to inject hundreds of monkeys with human tumors in a desperate effort to pinpoint a cancer germ, but of course to no avail. In Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor, written in 1977, she confronts the late 20th century era's preoccupation with cancer by comparing it to the previous tuberculosis epidemic, saying, now it is cancer's turn to be the disease that doesn't knock before it enters cancer that fills the role of an illness experienced as a ruthless secret invasion, a role it will keep until one day its etiology becomes as clear and its treatment as effective as those of TB have become. And so the unknowability of cancer is what made it so terrifying at the time. However, it also became an apt way to communicate the direness of the urban condition at the time and spur action. The concurrent epidemic of urban disinvestment, disintegration, and abandonment, commonly referred to as blight, often leaned on cancer as a metaphor, especially as it appeared to similarly eat cities from the inside out in the form of fire, vice, and crime. A geographer Michael Deere attempted to put a contagion to the patterns of blight, saying, the process of abandonment as it operates in space suggests an initial broad scattering of abandoned structures characterized internally by the occurrence of many small groups of abandoned houses. It is essentially a contagious sequence. Contagion has major implications for our understanding of the dynamics of abandonment and for later um, policy uh, considerations. The treatment of blight as a disease also extended to its physical documentation and mapping. Much like John Snow's cholera map from several de uh, decades before, blighted properties were documented by public health agencies by going from door to door searching for its sectors of, of vectors of contagion. In 1951, an issue of Architectural Forum advertised slum surgery in St. Louis, showing blighted and obsolete districts beginning to encroach on the rest of the city grid uh, in order to invoke fear um, and build up support for its stop. Similar to how these blight maps were drawn, an educational film from 1953 entitled The Warning Shadow used x-ray animations to depict the terrifying growth of a small black uh, dysplasia on a man's lung. The film ends with the patient agreeing to a pneumonectomy or surgical removal of the lung. Eradication by surgery or radium was the preferred treatment for the disease. And eventually that became the preferred treatment for the built environment as well as architects and planners seized on this treatment as a model for how blight should be treated in cities. At first, many municipal departments aided by private companies like the Rand Corporation uh, first attempted what they called immunizations, and that was increased municipal services, including fire and police stations and attempts to enforce stricter building codes. But when this failed, they turned toward urban chemotherapy, the total eradication of clusters of blight. In his book, The City, Its Growth, Its Decay and Its Future, E.L.L. Sarnen used a diagram of the disintegration of cells to discuss the disintegration of the fabric of the city and used the healthy cell as a model for rebuilding. And this is a literal plan that he's proposing on the right. Sarnen would write, the slums he clears by piecemeal mending and the old still infects the new in short order. The planner must know as well as the doctor that when the head aches, the stomach might be out of order. And the planner must be aware of the fact as well as the doctor that vitality cannot be transfused into a dead organ. The dead organ must be removed and the transfusion affected in a healthy part of the body. He must unearth the roots of evil. He must amputate slums by a decisive surgery and he must transfuse vitality only into those areas that are protected against contagion. As they had in the sanitary movement as well, children were invoked as innocent victims in order to further the cause. James W. Fallon, the commissioner of the Urban Renewal Administration at the time gave a talk called Slums and Blight, a Disease of Urban Life, which showed Gussie, a cartoon depiction of a waif-like young white girl as proxy for the deadly effect of slums on human lives. She is introduced standing on a pile of rubble or adrift on a sea of blight. 
The book shows a series of maps overlaying juvenile delinquency, lack of sanitation, tuberculosis, and population density, always showing the densest occurrences pointing to the center of cities. Later, as you see in that little inset photo, Gussie is seen wielding the gargantuan broom of code enforcement, uh, which was meant for increased health and sanitation codes in the city. And so to address the issue of blight, urban renewal documents from New York City to San Francisco depicted strikingly similar landscapes, sleek, sterile, modern towers on a flat platform of green. San Francisco's Jackson Square plan shown above is shown as isolated from any existing fabric, save for City Hall, with no mention of the Fillmore neighborhood um, as a cultural center for the West Coast small black population, which is what it replaced. Indeed, 80% of those removed by urban renewal were black. In Baltimore, the number was reported to be 100%. The logic of blight as disease was eradication, erasure, and reoccupation with a healthy graft of anonymous towers and green. And so that brings us to our uh, immediate pre-pandemic moment, um, the concentration of much of the literature that I started looking at um, early in my career and uh, in the writing of the book. Um, and coming to a conclusion that a lot of this architecture and urban design is meant to shape behavior instead. And it was also predicated by the rise um, of another epidemic. The CDC reported that in the United States, the percentage of overweight adults hovered around 31% between 1960 and 1994, and the percentage of adults categorized as obese increased from 13% to 23%, meaning by the mid-1990s, almost 55% of adults in the mid uh, were overweight or obese. Um, researchers started to draw connections between larger patterns of change in society, ranging from food availability and techn te uh, technological attachment. But a great deal of literature also started to point to sedentary lifestyles, encouraged by the unabated suburban growth oriented uh, around the automobile as a driver of the epidemic. By the end of the 20th century, the locus of disease would shift from the city to the suburbs. And those previous figures notwithstanding, the definition of obesity is still problematic in many respects, from the unreliability of the body mass index and its relationship to actual overall health to cultural and racial ideas of bodies and diets. Nevertheless, many designers and urban planners saw an opportunity to elevate their practice in the name of public health, um, but sometimes in the end, they actually exacerbated health inequities. Although I will say on a related point, many also pointed to the car, to car centric design as exacerbating climate change and urban heat islands, which also represented a larger existential threat to all of our health and still do. Uh, a movement in response, uh, we can, for a movement in response, we can point to the new urbanism movement, which was based on a highly specific urban and architectural code to build neo-traditional neighborhoods. Um, the, uh, the new urbanist literature's preoccupations with density formulas, land use, and the architectural form of dwelling with less attention to the overall landscape other than ensuring walkability has some of its roots in some of the er early neighborhood uh, planning documents um, of the 1960s. And some of the generalized observations and principles of the new urbanists, specifically Duane Plater Zyberg, the, um, the authors of the landmark book, Suburban Nation, were common sense and even admirable in theory. But when enacted on the ground, it became almost immediately problematic. In their steadfast belief that the old way of building was best, they often emphasized the historical blind spots of building for social change uh, and even doubled down on them. However, we can see Duane Plater Zyberg's urban codes as a prescriptive landscape. And it's not meant just to address obesity, um, but a claim to also improve social cohesion, civic participation, and above all, eliminate cars from the public realm. The early new urbanists were particularly taken with regional interpretations of European architecture in the Deep South. Duane and Plater Zyberg have cited their inspirations came from a road trip to towns such as Savannah, Charleston, and Natchez, Mississippi but often don't reference the racial, social, or class systems inherent in those different forms of dwelling. Most of all, building to these prescriptive guidelines was difficult to enact within the existing tangle of sprawl and was instead relegated to being built on green fields and far uh, from job centers. Um, and in many cases only served to increase it. However, the willingness of governments to invest in the supposedly curative effects of new urbanism became apparent when in the mid 1990s, new urbanism was adopted as the standard architectural and planning style of public housing under the Clinton administration's HOPE 6 uh, development plans. 
Pope VI did attempt to take some lessons learned from the disastrous mid-century modernist public housing developments. Uh, for instance, proposing a scattered site strategy that would strategically infill um, often slightly higher income neighborhoods with smaller scale single or multifamily housing. But just as in the mid-century, this tactic of adopting a very specific aesthetic for public housing, even if it was neo-traditionalism instead of modernism, still served to visually stigmatize those that lived within them while continuing to imply um, that those in public housing would be uplifted and have their morals corrected through architecture and design. And although more than anything else, it was a failure in administration than the architecture, the well-documented effects of displacement wrought by the HOPE-6 program as old high-density units were torn down to build newer but less numerous mid-scale ones um, also ended up being a large detriment to resident health. Nevertheless, the built environment is still widely viewed as a treatment for the obesity epidemic, extending from the figurative prescription of new urbanism to now literally being prescribed uh, by Obama's US Surgeon General, who is the US Surgeon General again, uh, as seen in this campaign uh, for the 2015 uh, Step It Up initiative. So it's, it's quite the move to have a Surgeon General actually thinking about the design of our built environments. And I think it means a lot for us that are working in that space, but. Um, taking into consideration what lessons we uh, have learned from the past are really important. Um, as cities and walkable neighborhoods uh, have become more in demand, these ostensibly healthier and greener neighborhoods have also become less affordable. We need to interrogate the idea that at the same time, the design planning and even the public health community is uh, denigrates the suburbs is also a time when the suburb is becoming more racially and economically heterogeneous, a far cry from those described 30 years ago in suburban nation. And moreover, we start to we need to rethink the idea in the United States that where we live is a free choice or that it always reflects one's moral fortitude. But this is sadly appropriate for a country that has always conflated wellness with personal responsibility. Uh, so I mentioned the book at the beginning of the talk, and I actually um, I, I turned in the manuscript just before the pandemic reached the, the U.S., so in uh, February 2020. Uh, but thank you for UVA Press for giving me the, the manuscript back so I could add a, a small COVID coda. Um, and I'm trying to work through some of the thoughts, even though we are living in it right now and the, the evidence is still emerging every day. Um, since the COVID-19 pandemic has come to the US, I've been thinking a lot about what are the recurring patterns we see. It feels like we've seen a century pass by in the past eight months. And we've seen 150 years um, of these fears of miasma, germs, and behavior, I think all intersect with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we know now that, uh, that uh, COVID-19 is in the air, which brings back the, the fears of miasma and the lessons learned from them. Uh, for some time, and maybe you still are, we sanitize our surfaces and our, uh, and our groceries with, for fear of germs. And of course, we've changed our behavior to quarantine and socially distance. At the same time, many of the ways past epidemics were addressed in the urban environment have proven to be consistent to today's pandemic. We know that green space is essential, sanitation is still key, clean air and water are probably the best things we can do for equitable health, but also that the design of where we live shapes essential access. And so what I'm here to talk about today is maybe not some of these design trends and, and think about what will stick, but rather what we can learn from past disease as a cautionary tale as we go forward. And so we can identify some of these patterns before they wreck the health of those most vulnerable to the illness. We have to keep in mind that the experiments and a lot of policy have first afflicted immigrants and communities of color. You can see here in this cartoon from Puck Magazine that cholera was conflated with immigrants. In fact, the title of this piece was called The, Ty the Kind of Assisted Immigrant We Cannot Afford to Admit. Cholera was depicted as a skeleton in vaguely Middle Eastern clothing. Um, over time, instead of taking consideration of the poor as a population vulnerable to disease, instead we have blamed them for spreading contagion. And often they have been systematically removed and quarantined physically or economically, or been subjected to architectural experiments built on narratives and metaphor rather than epidemiology um, or backed by uh, institutional support systems. Health has been used very explicitly to exclude certain populations. In 1922, a housing covenant for Silver Spring, Maryland read, 
For the purposes of sanitation and health, no owner will sell or lease the said land to any one of a race whose death rate is at a higher percentage than the white race. Germ theory in the language of quarantine was extensively used in Baltimore's residential segregation ordinance of 1910, which kept blacks from moving onto blocks that had a white majority of residents. Even when a series of coordinated actions by the city had excluded blacks from healthcare access and neighborhood improvements for decades prior, ensuring that their mortality rate would stay, uh, would, uh, stay higher. Similarly, in San Francisco's Chinatown, disease was used as a justification for the Department of Public Health to repeatedly raid and control the neighborhood's boundaries. And medical inspections and largely fabricated assessments on the nearby Angel Island Immigration Station were also used to keep Chinese out of the city altogether. And of course, we can see echoes in that in the recent rise in anti-Asian violence in our own country in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we must also consider how health has been used to exclude groups from desirable landscapes, from healthy landscapes, and conscribe them to landscapes of risk instead. A recent study from a group of University of California researchers, and in fact, more and more emerging research, um, has argued that we need to reckon how these social practices can have long lasting physiological effects. By overlaying mortgage companies redlining maps with health data, these researchers found that redline neighborhoods were still largely occupied by black populations and immigrants, and that there remained a plethora of environmental hazards there from air pollution to high lead content in the soil, resulting in among other disparities in health, a three times higher asthma rate in the black population than whites in the Bay Area. And we cannot forget that even the most celebrated healthy landscape, Central Park, designed by a revered landscape architect, an abolitionist, and a former public health officer, was built on the ruins of Seneca Village, which was a thriving African-American village that was nonetheless written up as a squatter's camp in the popular press, um, described and drawn to be squalid and pestilent uh, as, a, as a way to build support uh, for its removal for the new Central Park. And so to conclude, I would just ask us to instead, uh, instead of thinking about decontamination rooms or plexiglass desks, let us ask ourselves about the conditions that cause urban heat islands and air pollution disproportionately in black neighborhoods, which have now proven to be underlying causes for COVID-19 mortality. Instead of worrying about the conception of a very specific type of walkable and bikeable density that has dominated urban design discourse for the past couple of decades, can we concern ourselves with crowded housing for frontline workers who don't get the space to quarantine if one of them falls ill? Uh, we should ask ourselves what it is it about suburban neighborhoods that also saw spread uh, during, COVID during the COVID-19 pandemic. In the, beginning, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, I feel like I was, I was asked by numerous press outlets if the high rates in New York and Boston signaled the end of cities. And I think we can see from this talk that cities have never ended. They have always come back um, in one way or another. But where our discourse is focused can really set the tone for the next few decades. Now that it's abated in many urban areas and the pandemic uh, um, has spiked in other places and is luckily abating now as well, but the rates were just as high in the suburbs of Phoenix, in rural areas of South Dakota, which is where I come from, and most crucially the black and brown neighborhoods of the very same cities we were worried about before. Places that lie at the margins, um, and in the suburbs. And we should also be asking ourselves, what is it about these environments that is accelerating the rate of infection? Ultimately, the environment doesn't cause or cure disease, but it is a key factor in either providing opportunities for health or creating the risk of illness. And the landscapes we inhabit do embed themselves in our bones and organs, some pathways known and some not. In her essay, Shifting Sites, uh, landscape architect Christina Hill, another uh, former UVA uh, faculty member, discussed how in culture and in ecological science, we have long viewed our skins as a boundary between us and the natural world. But instead it is permeable to energy, materials and organisms. And as we now know the burdens of an inequitable social system, accumulating illness, but also as a possibility to build resilience over generations. And so as we endure this crisis and understand that there are others ahead of us, let us take what we've learned from history and shape a healthier future for all. Thank you. Sarah, that, that was wonderful. And um, I wish we could give you some real, <laughs> uh, real time applause. Uh, maybe we can do that at the end or the, yeah. <laughs> the few of us on, on screen anyway. Um, just wonderful and, a, and a, a wonderful book. And uh, so I've got just seven or eight minutes and I wanna just uh, kind of amplify some of the points that you're 
making. Um, and the first is <clears throat> that I really enjoyed uh, reading the book and there, there are so many uh, histories that I didn't fully understand uh, in sort of health in the built environment area. Uh, health resorts, uh, children's playground movement, um, medical mo models of the city, even the history of cemeteries that I, I didn't really fully uh, understand. And it's a really uh, historically sweeping book as your slides today uh, show well from you know, cholera epi epidemics of the 1830s all the way to the, the present pan pandemic. So congratulations on, on the book. And I, I, I've been carrying around a printed copy with uh, all, all these passages highlighted and, and pages dog-eared, dog and I'm looking forward to getting my actual published uh, version. So um, in the time that I have, I want to just amplify a couple of things, and maybe uh, three points primarily, building on your wonderful chapter eight, which is entitled The New Ecology of Health, um, as well as some of what you're saying about the pandemic and what we're learning about our reactions to the pandemic. And the first point is, is really, uh, from my point of view, the, the, the special power of nature. And, and just to amplify what you're already saying in the book and you've said today, but nature is really something, it's not optional in my mind. It's absolutely essential uh, in our design and planning and our, in our conceptions of, of cities. Um, it, it's something we have to, we have to incorporate in, into the very core of everything that we do. I was, uh, it was great to see that you had quoted uh, E.O. Wilson in the book um, and, and talked a bit about, about biophilia, this innate uh, connection, this innate affiliation we have uh, with, with nature and the growing body of, of evidence. It seems almost weekly there is a new study showing the power of nature, the healing power, the therapeutic power that we are happier, healthier, less stressed when we have uh, nature uh, all around us. And great to see that you uh, quoted our, our, our uh, uh, Jenny Rowe, our, the director of our Center for Design and, and Health. So um, we have increasingly been arguing for this idea of biophilic cities, which brings the, the density, the compactness, um, uh, many of the health qualities that you've mentioned about cities together with nature. And it's nature that's not just an ornament or, or an aesthetic detail, an aesthetic design element, but rather, again, a central organizing feature uh, of cities. So a kind of new way of thinking about cities. In practice, what this means for cities is that we, we think beyond this, this uh, just parks, we think beyond this notion that there is nature in cities, but it, they're in, in designated places that you have to go and visit and, and see, but rather seeing the entire city as a natural system, which, which it is. Uh, and aspiring to a kind of immersive nature. It's, nature's all around us. We don't have to go to the park. We're living in the park. We're living in the forest. It's integrated, it's continuous, it's, it's seamless. And we're integrating built environments and, and natural systems, integrating um, you know, rooftop meadows and living walls uh, that meet uh, various levels of tree canopy cover that, that connect with ground level uh, nature. And we see it as a a kind of whole of city approach too, that it's, it's room and rooftop to region or bioregion and all of the spaces in between. And it's certainly partly about redesigning buildings and imagining more biophilic nature for full buildings, but it's also those spaces between and beyond the buildings to, to paraphrase uh, Danish urban designer, Jan Gale. And it's a whole of life approach, right? We want to, we want to nature in the early years of life. We want every school to be natureful, uh, but we also want those opportunities, those connections to nature to extend throughout the one's life uh, and, and, uh, and even into, uh, into elderhood to, to use uh, Louise Aronson's uh, wonderful uh, term. And, and this vision is a vision of cities that contain wildness, right? And, biodiversity and many other forms of life. Uh, we wanna make room for other forms of life and, and uh, we wanna live in a multi-species uh, city. So we started this, um, this network of cities, the Biophilic Cities Network, um, and we have 25 cities now that are aspiring to this sort of uh, vision. And we really feel like that's gaining uh, some traction. I think it just, it builds on what you're 
a saying about what we increasingly know about the power of, of nature. And it also seems, you, you talked about ecological services a little bit uh, today, I investing in nature in cities does so many other things for us that connect to health. And I think that's worth uh, saying uh, or emphasizing. So, so for example, food production, I know community gardens, front yard, backyard gardens, rooftop farms, balcony growing systems, they, they're biophilic, they connect us to nature, but they also help to address food insecurity or urban heat, uh, tree planting. We know studies now showing that uh, if we plant trees in the right places in cities, we can literally change the microclimate. We can reduce you know, summer nighttime temperatures by 15 degrees in some, in some cities. Or sleep, uh, sleep and health. We're growing appreciation for the, the huge impact that not just the quantity, but the quality of sleep uh, has on, 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 on overall health. And we know that city planning and neighborhood design have a huge impact on you know, noise. And we want to re reduce, we want cities that reduce noise, but also celebrate um, natural soundscapes and, and in particular birds. So that's first point is just to amplify what you've said about the power of nature. Um, a second related point is just to recognize that during this pandemic, I think that that power, that importance of nature is even more evident to us. Uh, and, and I mean, we've seen such uh, high levels of anxiety and stress and depression in the pandemic for, for obvious reasons. Uh, nature for a lot of us has been a savior. It's been a balm, a, a solve. It's been that thing that's, that's given us some element of normalcy. Um, the birds are still singing, the birds are still migrating, and we've seen unprecedented demand, right, in, in, in cities to, uh, for folks to visit parks, and, and in some of our partner cities in the, in the network, we've been trying to sort of capture the things that they've been doing in real time to make that nature more available, and Portland, Oregon has, you know, changed the direction of, of pathways and parks to sort of maximize the, you know, uh, numbers of people that can be outside in a, in a park. San Francisco famously closing streets and, and developing, creating this network of slow streets. So I think the pandemic uh, is a real game changer when it comes to thinking about nature. We, we want to open windows. We want to stand outside on our balconies. We want to plant things. We want to be outside. We want to visit parks. We want to stroll and watch the sky. And um, for me, doing a lot of recent work around this idea of a bird-friendly city and, and the importance of birds, really interesting evidence that, that um, the, the traffic to, to bird sites, websites has gone way up, the download of bird watching apps, that people are buying um, feeders and bird seed. And, and I think we're literally hatching a new generation of bird lovers and bird watchers. And so I hope that's true. And, and I've been saying for a long time that we need to start judging the goodness of a city by its birdsong and how, how ubiquitous that, that birdsong is. Third and final point, again, amplifying the point you've made, is, is the importance of social equity, um, what we sometimes call just biophilia. Um, you and one of your, one of the chapters is titled Whose Wealth, or Whose Wellness, rather. Uh, we equally, could equally ask whose nature. So we know there isn't a, a fair and just distribution of nature right now and, and, and nature's benefits, health, health and other benefits. Uh, we believe nature is a birthright, but it's clearly not available to everyone, to all, to neighbor, neighborhoods of color especially, it's not there to the same degree and in the same uh, quality. So we have this, this problem of systemic racism and social inequality and it translates directly into inequality and the enjoyment of the benefits of nature. And you've said that in, 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 your, in your book. And I think we've seen how this has been reinforced uh, during the pandemic. Neighborhoods of color having fewer spaces, fewer parks, uh, study by the Trust for Public Land showing that uh, you know, neighborhoods of color are, 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 if they have a park at all, is likely to be half the size um, of, a, of a, a white affluent a neighborhood. And this is not a surprise. And that's what one of the striking things from your book, and you've, you've talked about it today, is that it seems like uh, injustice and racial inequality are sort of baked into the history of, uh, of health and responses to health and the design of, of uh, cities and, and neighborhoods. And, you, you know, from early, as you talked about racial covenants, and you just mentioned redlining, 
uh, to even the story of Central Park built, built you know, on and displacing a, a, an African-American community. So um, we have a number of our partner cities that are trying to tackle this issue and begin to address it. Uh, Richmond, Virginia, for example, is a, a guardedly positive story in that regard, a new draft comprehensive plan that lays out minimum tree canopy targets for all neighborhoods with a focus on underserved neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are higher uh, on the heat vulnerability index. Uh, the current mayor, LeVar Stoney, uh, has taken real leadership, uh, shown real leadership on this and in the fall announced five new parks uh, in underserved neighborhoods. And that's really, really positive. And we're seeing new uh, initiatives, new, new ways of thinking about uh, uh, parks. Um, the 11th Street Bridge Park in, in, in Washington is a wonderful example where they've, they've developed a, an equitable development plan um, even before the, the, the park is, is fully funded and, and built. So, so there's some positive things on the horizon there, but so social equity has to be right, has to be front and center. And it's a, a huge challenge uh, for us. So in, in envisioning any kind of future city, uh, in, including this vision of a biophilic city that I've been talking about. Okay, um, that's more than seven minutes. Um, so I, I get the, the privilege of asking you um, a, a first couple or question or two. And I wanna go back actually to your wonderful discussion of new urbanism, um, because I think the maybe the obvious question is, uh, that's an example of, of an imperfect uh, approach, right? Uh, for lots of the reasons you you mentioned, where do you where do you see an optimistic uh, kind of model? Um, and and could could we take some of the attributes of new urbanism, the walkability, the compact urban form, um, disconnect some of the things we don't like about it, make it more inclusive as a model, more affordable? Um, what what are you, where are you seeing kind of a positive vision or a positive model for for neighborhood design or or city design, any any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I um, yeah, imperfect model is it? I think the perfect way to describe that. And I I think you know only maybe where new urbanism oversteps is making a lot of assumptions about you know what people want to do with their time um, and and with the walking. That it's not always about a leisurely stroll, but it's about getting to the services you need if you don't have a lot of extra time in your day, right? So getting to the grocery store, getting to the schools. I give them all the credit for bringing walking advocacy back into it and bringing that into the conversation and talking about how public spaces and connections and, and street connectivity is not just about physical activity, but it's a way towards um, civic cohesion, right? And, 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 so, and social cohesion as well. I think, um, you know, and whether it's, it, maybe it's not in the, uh, the fault of the, the new urbanists themselves, but maybe how it's interpreted, right, by a government agency such as HUD, where they're just looking at the form, right, and they say, okay, well, it's just, but which is which is odd because actually I was I was recently doing some research. You know, there's a there's a new urbanist housing development that was built in New Orleans, and those are ostensibly like where the forms come from, but it still seems really out of place. You know, where they've rebuilt one of these these Hurricane Katrina um, destroyed public housing units, and so I think. Again, it's just sort of a, a, an undue concentration on form and not in those general principles that um, walking is important, compact neighborhoods are important, having services are important. And uh, you know, as a as a mother of young kids too, I, I really um, I I would advocate for their um, you know their principle that school should be around walking distance and neighborhoods should be around schools and that people that live around the schools are the ones that are investing in it, right? And it makes a it, and it makes a community. So I believe those principles are um, are, are very common sense and, and even needed, but it, just a little bit more thinking about how they get translated to diverse environments, right? Without again, that, that sort of undue um, concentration on, on form and what the houses look like or what, what, a, what a neighborhood center looks like, right? A neighborhood center can take many, many forms. It might be a strip mall, right? But how do we make that strip mall look, uh, look more, uh, how do we make, how do we get people to stay in the strip mall, right? And enjoy the yeah. house. Right? Well, that's a, an interesting question. You, you rightly criticize new urbanism for sort of focusing on uh, greenfield locations. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, what, what's the, the chance, the opportunity for us to kind of retrofit existing suburban environments. We've seen a lot of recent developments that are positive, 
Portland, Oregon, you know, uh, making duplexes and triplexes by right uses that, you know, shifting towards the kind of missing middle housing. Can we densify? Can we um, focus on existing neighborhoods and, and make them more walkable and, and healthier? I hope so. And I mean, you look at the work of scholars such as um, June Williamson, who is who's also an urbanist, right, and I talk about in the book, um, who are, are dealing with suburban environments on that very incremental level and, and thinking about um, thinking about those improvements in place. Um, I think transit is a big part of that. I, I am concerned that right now we seem to be at a point where uh, I mean, luckily, there's the federal investment now um, in, in public transit, but even in Massachusetts, where I live, which is a, a fairly transit well-connected town, and, and the governor's holding back funding uh, for increasing frequency <laughs> on transit, uh, you know, or, and not thinking about housing around transit anymore, because people fear it from the pandemic. That's a real danger, I think, and that's, that's something we have to forge ahead on. And so I, I just feel this... Um, thinking about how transit integrates in all neighborhoods, suburban neighborhoods, connects people to the city, right? Especially if they're not going there as frequently with commuting, um, it's, it's a big part of making more sustainable suburban neighborhoods. But when you have the CDC recommending that people drive alone in their cars to work, that oh, obviously yeah, see, is, uh, no. yeah, it doesn't, doesn't pretend good things for, for a country that's, no. that sort of fears public transit in the first place. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Okay, uh, Marcia's probably not gonna let me ask any more questions. <laughs> I, think, I think we'll go to um, questions we've heard uh, also from our audience, but I'd like to thank both of you for illuminating um, remarks. Uh, Sarah's book is wonderful as Tim has suggested. Um, it's quite provocative in, in what it asks us to think about yesterday, today, and, and tomorrow. So one of the uh, questions we have, um, goes to uh, one of the points that, that Sarah was making that linked us back to the 19th century as well. And that was that air, sunlight and foliage have, um, have a lot of, of healing and healthy potential. Well, one of our questions raises um, issues around an area of our country that has a lot of air, sunshine and foliage, but not a lot of density, also not a lot of transit. So, what about rural spaces? And some of the concerns that we've had around the health of rural populations, mm -hmm. those concerns have deepened uh, during the pandemic. Some of the connectivity that isn't there, some of the transportation challenges. Um, you know, what kinds of um, insights might you have about improving things for our rural communities, um, for their health, but also for, for other aspects of well-being. Yeah, this um, especially hits home for me, as I, I mentioned briefly, I'm from Western South Dakota. I, I grew up on a, on a cattle ranch uh, in the Black Hills, uh, for those of you familiar. My, my parents who are aging um, are still there. Uh, it was terrifying when South Dakota had the highest rates of COVID-19 <laughs> rates, right, uh, per capita for, for some time. And, um, you know, uh, oh, they, they got their second vaccination this week, <laughs> so I'm hoping right. to come back there. Um, and so, yeah, I think what this speaks to, though, is that um, sometimes it's not always about these first provisions that we think about uh, of sunlight um, and green space and fresh air. They have lots of that, but there are lots of other health issues, just as you mentioned, the connectivity, right? And so it's about prioritizing um, certain things. And we shouldn't neglect these places just because they have an abundance of what we would call healthy landscapes. Um, you know, what rural places don't have often, um, as I've seen where I grew up, is basic healthcare services, right? And uh, distributed healthcare services. And, and I hope that is something that comes through in the, the book as well, is that no landscape is going to replace a nationalized public healthcare system. Right, and, and that's what I saw in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina when there were no hospitals. And that's what I started to think about a bit. Louisiana has incredible health disparities in healthcare access as well. And so thinking about landscape as a, as a mediator, maybe bet between that access in urban areas, but in rural areas, it's more about that connectivity. It's more about the distributed health system. It's more about building in place and building in communities, right? So I would say one thing, again, you know, 
upending our ideas that urban places are healthy or rural places are healthy and suburbs are unhealthy. Um, you know, Massachusetts, we don't have a great vaccination rollout because it's all the mass vaccination sites. Where my parents live, they are giving out vaccinations at their town hall, which is a town of 63 people, right? And they're giving it to volunteer fire departments. So finding localized places, finding the places that, that, that mean a lot to people, even if they are not the aesthetic ideal of health is the first thing we have to do and invest in those places and, and understand um, where where people return to and places that are, are beloved to them. Sure, what you said yeah. about transportation is a is an issue for rural areas as well too. Yeah, right? absolutely. You, just, yeah. Just, you might be stranded somewhere as an older person, for example. Uh, I know there are innovative paratransit systems in rural environments, but mobility is a, is a huge uh, issue. Mobility is huge. And I saw it, you know, with, with my parents and they had to take care of my grandparents who didn't want to leave the ranch, but they lived in their own house for some time and they did not want to move um, into town, but it was very hard to get care out to them, um, you know, and, and um, so, you know, again, I think, um, but how this relates to architecture maybe is upending some of our ways we think about living, like, you know, can we think about accessory dwelling units, right, to keep, um, to, to keep the elderly closest to us, can we, and again, can we think about more of those in-home um, care systems. Um, you know, something I learned uh, before I came to Northeastern University, I was at University of Hawaii. Uh, in Honolulu, which is a very dense area. And something that was really heartening to me was so many of my students lived with their grandparents, you know, just because of the culture, um, you know, more uh, a, an Asian culture there as, as well that uh, kind of embraces intergenerational living. So many of them for the thesis projects they picked were about intergenerational uh, living, whether it was about ADUs or it was about, you know, uh, apartment, high rise apartment buildings that would be retrofitted to, to get elderly to access green easily. Uh, right. So Tim always refer, I often refer them to your biophilic cities <laughs> um, literature. So Hawaii, which is thought of as one of the healthiest places on earth in a, in a beautiful landscape, but you know, there are still quite a few people that, that, that couldn't access it. And I, I think, um, but I think again, it's it's a cultural shift as well, and what we think about as as health, and this is a distinction I try and, and make in the book as well, is that wellness is different from health, right? Wellness is about a conception. In the United States, wellness is often about something that we can consume, right? That's for consumption. But health is actually much more incremental. It's about design hand in hand with policy, and it's in uh, it's it's hand in hand with maintenance and care as well. I'm afraid that we're out of time. But you've left us with so many things to think about. Um, what health means, what wellness means, what life post COVID means. And we had a number of questions um, that are gonna have, um, have us thinking about, you know, is, does having a vaccine mean we don't have to redesign anything? Um, I hope we can no, learn. That's, no. that's what they always have to do. Right, there's <laughs> not plenty. Forget. <laughs> right, there's plenty to think about, and I'd like to thank yeah. both of you, Sarah Jensen Carr and Tim Beatley, for sharing this very provocative hour with us. We're going to go back out into our world, into our natural world, and look at things quite differently. I'll invite all of our audience to uh, join us next week when we welcome the author uh, Samuel Shem, who uh, wrote 40 some years ago, The House of God. He's coming to talk with us on staying human in medicine, the danger of isolation and the healing power of good connection. Thank you again, and uh, we will see you all next week. Okay. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you, Tim. Sarah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.